Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, this is Dr. L and in this segment we are going to talk about applying our classical theory of asset pricing to a very particular type of uh, cash flow stream known as the uniform annuity. Uh, so that is what we're going to be talking about in this video. Um, we're going to start by uh, thinking about pricing this uniform annuity flow and uh, arguably this is the core foundational element of all discounted cash flow modeling. Uh, if you can understand this one, um, then more complicated uh, structured models are just a little bit, um, you know, slight variations, slight tweaks of this. And we're gonna take a look at one of those tweaks uh, in the next segment when we consider what's called the growth annuity framework. Uh, but today what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by applying the classical theory of asset pricing. Uh, we're going to use a geometric series result to help us simplify the pricing formula and find an analytical solution to price this uh, asset known as a uniform annuity. And then we're going to apply that formula to two situations. Um, the first is we're going to think about amortizing uh, a lump sum value. Uh, for example, if you wanted to take out a home loan, against the remaining balance of the home price after putting down your down payment. Uh, the bank would need to figure out how to convert the loan amount that they give you into the stream of equivalent mortgage payments that you would pay back uh, as you make your mortgage payments back to the bank, back to the lender. Uh, the second application is gonna involve us thinking about how to price something known as a perpetual annuity flow uh, and that's actually an asset that you could think about that makes payments and never stops making payments. It makes payments forever. Um, and we'll actually, oddly enough, wind up finding a uh, analytical solution that is a finite value for such an asset, even though it makes uh, benefit payments into perpetuity uh, forever. Uh, so before we get into this, I just wanted to iterate uh, a few prerequisites about where we've come to so, so far. We've thought about this general case of a cash flow stream, and we've described it by this vector X with the little arrow over it, uh, which is really representing a series of different payments, uh, payments coming in period zero, one, two, so on and so forth, out to period T. Uh, and we're considering a very general case right now uh, where these payments may be different, hence the uh, subscripts on each time period are allowing for those uh, X values to be different. Um, we then considered how to think about valuing this cash flow stream by discounting each of those payments, converting them into present dollars, and applying the net present value calculation by summing up the discounted values of each payment uh, measured in the same units, measured in present dollars. Uh, from there, we uh, took a slightly different perspective and we defined what was known as the single period discount factor which was the inverse of this factor uh, one plus R. And we rewrote the net present value expression in terms of the discount factor. And that was a little bit cleaner in that it got rid of the fractions for us. Uh, the next thing we had done is we applied the classical theory of asset prices, which utilized a no arbitrage argument to argue that the present value uh, really the net present value of any assets future cash flow stream that it generates uh, would define the fair market price of that asset so this was an important connection that allowed us to link the actual price of the asset to the present value of the benefit stream that it generates and now we have a nice framework where we can think about really pricing any asset um, you know whether it's a financial asset or whether it's a piece of let's say agricultural land that yields a certain value of crops to you each period. Uh, in either case, we can look at the cash flow stream or the stream of benefits that are generated from owning the asset, from holding the asset. We can discount those into present dollars and we apply the classical theory of asset prices and argue that that should be the fair market value of the cash flow stream of the asset itself. Now, before we specifically look at this case of what's known as a uniform annuity flow, uh, we're going to change just two minor things about the framework we've been working in thus far. We've been considering a very general cash flow stream where payments start in period zero and they end in period T, and those payments can potentially be different. Uh, for our applications to asset pricing, the first thing we're going to change is we're no longer going to have that X zero term uh, showing up. There's going to be no more payment in period zero. 
And at time zero, the only cash payment that's gonna be made is the buyer of the asset is gonna have a cash outflow equal to the size of the asset's current market price. Uh, and it wouldn't make sense at the time you buy the asset at time zero for the asset to also make a payment to you of X zero. Um, you know, for example, when you go and you buy a bond or you buy a stock, the day you buy the bond or stock, you pay some money for it, and then you own the right to the future cash flow. But it wouldn't make sense if you bought a stock for $100 for all of a sudden they say, okay, well, we're going to immediately pay you a $2 dividend, right? An X zero payment in that moment, uh, when really what they should have done is subtract that $2 from the $100 price that they were charging and just call it a $98 stock price without any period zero payment. Um, so the first change, we're going to get rid of X zero. Okay, first payment is going to be X1 in period one. Um, second change, okay, once we have gotten rid of X0, is we're gonna add a little bit of structure to the problem here. Uh, and we're gonna consider a specific case of a uniform annuity, uh, which is just a fancy name for a cash flow stream where the size of the X values, the size of the payments being made in every period are all the same. Um, so we can then think about just getting rid of the subscripts, those time subscripts, and rewrite the cash flow stream now as just a series of X dollar payments. Uh, there are exactly T of these payments, and again, they are now beginning in period one since we've eliminated X zero from our analysis. Um, so this particular structure of a cash flow stream that we're looking at now is known as a finite uniform annuity flow. Finite because it ends after T periods. We'll look at the infinite uh, case in a moment. Uh, it's uniform in the sense that the size of each of the cash flow payments are equal to each other. Uh, and again, understanding how to price this type of asset is really a core building block uh, with respect to asset pricing theory and uh, valuation. So, Objective here is we want to price this uniform annuity flow. Uh, and again, the uniform annuity flow involves payments starting in period one, ending in period T. And we're gonna do this using uh, the discount factor perspective for a moment. We'll bring back the interest rate later so you can see both perspectives on how to compute the actual price of this cash flow stream. And what we're gonna do next is we're gonna drop all the subscripts on the X's and impose the uniformity condition. So now instead of X1, X2, and so on and so forth, each term is the same value. And you'll note uh, from each one of those terms in that last line, we can actually factor out not just an X, but we can also factor out one delta, right? We can pull an X delta out from every one of those terms. And when we do that, the first term we'll have left is just a one where the uh, first X delta was. And then we'll have a delta plus another delta squared, so on and so forth. So we wind up after factoring out the X delta, we wind up getting uh, what looks like a geometric series in the parentheses. Um, so at this point, we're more or less done. We found the pricing formula here. So if I told you what the size of the payments were in the cash flow stream, I'd give you the value X. If I told you how many payments were being made or for how many periods, then you would know T. And if we told you what the discount rate, what the effective interest rate was, then you would be able to calculate Delta, right? Delta was one over one plus the discount rate. Uh, so you would have all three of those relevant values. You'd have X, you'd have Delta, you'd have T, you plug them into this formula, and that would give you the price of that cash flow stream of that asset. Uh, note that computing this in this particular form that we're looking at it now can be a little bit uh, intense in that if T is very big, like if you're dealing with, uh, for example, we'll see in a moment a uh, situation where we have 360 mortgage payments to deal with. Uh, if T was 360, then that means in the parentheses here, you would have 360 terms to add up and you would have T terms to add up there. And you can imagine on a test, if you were doing that with your calculator, that would be very, very cumbersome and take a very long time. So we're gonna spend just a little bit of time going through a hiatus here of how to simplify uh, this term in red 
in a way that makes it a little bit more compact uh, in terms of computational efficiency. Uh, this will also make it more accessible for us to relate uh, the pricing function for the simple case of a uniform annuity to other um, pricing functions that we're gonna look at moving forward. Uh, so let's talk about the issue here. Uh, given the pricing formula that we've derived, there's a little portion of it, and that is the portion in parentheses that is somewhat cumbersome in that if T is large, we have a lot of different terms to add up. Uh, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna rewrite this expression, uh, that expression in parentheses, using a little bit of a trick. Okay, so let's define here a value for the uh, term in the parentheses, and let's call that value A. And our goal essentially is to be able to rewrite an expression for A, and we're gonna do that by comparing it for a moment to the value of delta times A. Okay, so we're gonna take the discount factor and multiply it by A. So if we did that, we distributed a delta into A, the first term you would get uh, where the one is would be a delta, and then the second term you get is a delta squared, cubed, so on and so forth. Okay. And the reason why we're doing this will become apparent in just a moment. If you're not sure about why, just remember we're trying to rewrite an expression for A. And we're going to do that by essentially taking A and we're going to subtract from it the value of delta A. So remember what A was? Here we're going to subtract from A the value of delta A. And you'll notice when we do this, there are many, many terms on the right-hand side of the equal sign that are going to cancel out, right? All the delta terms, aside from delta to the T, will wind up canceling with each other. And the only terms we're going to be left with on the right-hand side now are going to be the one in the top and the delta T in the second line, the delta to the T power. So we go ahead now, we can do that subtraction, and we wind up with the following result which gives us a single equation. And we can now use this equation to solve for A. It's kind of a sneaky trick here. We can factor out an A from the left-hand side, divide through by one minus delta. And this will now allow us to rewrite an expression for A here. Instead of that cumbersome geometric series where we were adding up T terms, now A is just expressed as the ratio of one minus delta to the T all over the quantity one minus delta. Uh, so what we essentially did here is we just proved the following mathematical fact. And that is this geometric series, the cumbersome term in parentheses to the left of the equal sign in that bottom line can be written in a more compact notation. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is go back to our pricing formula and we're gonna substitute this compact notation in for that term that was causing us a little bit of trouble. Okay, so we left off about here. Okay, we recognize there were some computational difficulties uh, calculating that geometric series. So we thought about rewriting the term in parentheses and uh, we took a little bit of a hiatus. Uh, you won't need to know how to prove that for the exam or anything, but you should know how to apply it uh, in this context. So we're basically gonna substitute all those terms in the parentheses with this factor one minus delta, the t, delta to the t all over one minus delta. And that makes the pricing formula a little bit more compact in terms of us not having to add up uh, a bunch of numbers anymore. If I give you x, I give you r, I give you t, we plug those values in here, we get delta, and we would have the price of the associated cash flow stream. Now, uh, recall, leading up to this discussion that we were also able to write the present values in terms of the interest rate, right? Delta is equal to one over one plus R. So if we wanted to, we could rewrite the pricing function in terms of uh, the interest rate, or we could make the interest rate visible. And I think the first thing I would do in order to make life a little easier here is I'm gonna reassociate some terms. I'm gonna take the denominator of the term of parentheses and I'm gonna move it over to the left above the delta that's floating next to the X. So same form on the right side. We just reassociated the denominator here. This is all a legal move. And next we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna get rid of delta. We're gonna bring back R to make the interest rate visible here. 
so we could write the pricing function and see it in terms of the interest rate. Sometimes it's more convenient, I think, to manipulate the pricing function in terms of the discount factor delta, but in many applications, it's maybe more convenient to express the pricing function in terms of the discount rate, the interest rate R. Uh, so in order to make the interest rate visible, we're carefully gonna substitute out for that discount factor delta, uh, and this will yield for us the following expression. Okay, so that first term in parentheses where we have delta over one minus delta, uh, if you carefully substitute uh, out for the definition of delta, uh, you will see that that simplifies to one over one plus r, or sorry, just a one over r, okay, after the uh, second equal sign. Uh, so make sure you're comfortable uh, with that algebra. You can see where that comes from. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, sometimes it's easier to work in terms of the discount factor delta, um, less fractions to deal with. Other times it's easier to work in terms of the discount rate, the interest rate R, uh, and we'll see an example of this shortly. So again, we have these two different perspectives on the pricing function, one in terms of the discount factor, one in terms of the discount rate. If you know R, you know delta and vice versa, right? Two-way street there. Uh, and you can use either of these to calculate the price of the uniform cash flow that we've been considering this uh, uniform finite annuity. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at an example here of applying the uniform uh, annuity pricing formula that we've just derived. And we're gonna utilize the pricing formula in terms of the interest rate here, in terms of the discount rate. And we're gonna use it to think about pricing an annuity stream that makes annual payments of $20,000 every year for the next 30 years at an annual interest rate of 5%. Uh, so this is actually a type of asset that people buy. They buy a thing called an annuity. And um, typically you would do this uh, if you were, for example, preparing for retirement. Uh, you know, when you retire, you're not gonna have any work income. So typically what people will do is they'll take a chunk of their savings and they'll use that to buy an annuity and the annuity makes them payments into the future uh, by tagging on a little bit of interest. Um, so all we're gonna do here is substitute these parameter values into the pricing formula to figure out uh, how much it would cost if you wanted a financial institution to actually offer you the service of providing you this cash flow stream, right? They're gonna give you $20,000 every year for the next 30 years. Question is, what do you have to give them now? What is the price of that cash flow stream uh, according to the classical uh, theory of asset prices? And again, we can plug in the parameter values here, right? X is 20,000, T is 30 years, R, the annual interest rate is 5%. And if we plug those in, uh, we see that this annuity would cost us $307,000 Three, sorry, $307,449. Um, so if you wanted to save up and have that type of supplemental income when you retire and get this payment of $20,000 every year to help you survive, you would need to have saved up at least this amount of money, $307,449, in order to buy that type of cash flow stream. <laughs> Uh, the other application we're going to take a look at here um, is we're going to think about coming back and revisiting this topic of amortization. Now, we discussed amortization in the, co in the context of calculating things like straight line depreciation expense, where we would take a lump sum cost and we would think about spreading that cost evenly over a particular time horizon. Now the problem with that particular treatment uh, was we didn't give any credence to this idea that uh, dollars measured at different times are actually valued differently, right? A dollar today is different than a dollar tomorrow. A dollar in January is different than a dollar in February. Uh, so what we would like to do is take slightly uh, a more critical thinking perspective here and thinking about this process of amortizing. Uh, and in doing that, we're gonna go back to the idea that when we were computing net present values, what we were actually doing is we were converting a cash flow stream into a single lump sum value, an LSV. 
So the direction of conversion looked like the following. Okay, now it turns out when we amortize uh, a lump sum payment and we incorporate the time value of money, the opportunity cost of time aspect, what we're actually doing is we're reversing this process, right? We wanna think about moving in the opposite direction and consider this problem of how can we engineer a cash flow stream that's equivalent to a particular lump sum value. Um, and one example we're gonna see here is that a creditor, or the bank for example, when they give you a mortgage or they make a loan, and they wanna compute what your payment schedule is gonna to be to pay back that loan, typically a very common structure of, payment schedule, of repayment schedules on loans is a uniform annuity repayment schedule, right? Your problem most likely if you have student loans, the size of your student loan doesn't change uh, every period, the size of your student monthly student loan payment, for example, it's probably uniform. Um, so what the bank has to do is they have to take this lump sum of money that they're gonna give you, right? They loan you that chunk of money and they have to figure out how do we convert that money into a cash flow stream that also recoups the interest uh, by accounting for the time value, the opportunity cost of those dollars that were loaned out. Uh, so amortizing with time value allows us to reverse this process so that we're able to think about starting with the lump sum value and reverse engineering the associated cash flow stream that's equivalent uh, to that lump sum value in terms of the net present value of the cash flow stream. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and apply this idea of amortization, uh, exploiting the uniform annuity framework. And to do this, we're going to begin with the uniform annuity pricing function or the pricing formula. And again, this is expressed uh, in this situation in terms of the interest rate, I think winds up being more convenient uh, for this particular application. And in amortizing a lump sum payment, what we're really asking here is, what is the associated size of the payment X in that uniform cash flow stream uh, given a lump sum value of P at an interest rate of R over a time horizon of size T? And to answer this question, right, what is the size of X? All we really need to do here is think about inverting the pricing formula by solving or isolating X and getting all the other values, getting P, R, and T all on the other side of the equation so we can get X alone. So uh, it turns out if you do this, so maybe you might wanna pause the video and take a moment and try this on your own. Um, but if you do this, you should wind up getting the following value. <laughs> and so this again is the size of the particular payment corresponding to a uniform cash flow stream that corresponds to a single lump sum value of P. Okay. Now, uh, algebraically, the way I would recommend uh, solving this is by first multiplying through by R, that'll move the R in that fraction in the top line over to the left-hand side. And that's where this PR term comes from. We move that one over R over to the left. We get the PR alone. And then the second thing we do is we wind up getting a common denominator in this red term in the big parentheses here. The common denominator will be one plus R, that quantity to the T power. And then we divide through after we get that common denominator by everything in red, and that will uh, translate into these terms here and isolate X for us. Okay, so make sure you can do that substitution. You see that algebra and that these two equations that we're looking at on the slide, they are the same equation. Just ones in terms of P, ones in terms of X. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead now and do a numerical example where we consider amortizing a home loan into a mortgage payment stream. So we're gonna consider this task of computing the size of your mortgage payments. And this is gonna require us to convert the loan balance of our mortgage, okay, which is a lump sum value into a future cash flow stream that has the uniform annuity structure, right? If you uh, have a fixed rate mortgage, the mortgage payments you make every month, they are the same size. The payment doesn't change and bounce around or grow with the value of your home. So we're gonna consider purchasing a home here with a selling price equal to 500,000. So we're gonna get a half a million dollar home. 
And uh, we're going to go ahead and make a 20% down payment, which is fairly standard. Uh, if you want to avoid paying things like uh, a lot of types of mortgage insurance require a 20% down payment, maybe less now, uh, but in the past 20% usually got you out of that. Uh, so we're going to put down a hundred thousand dollars. We don't have half a million bucks lying around probably, at least I don't. Uh, so we put down a hundred thousand against the price of the home. Uh, which means we need to take out a mortgage against the remaining $400,000 balance from the bank. And we're going to go ahead and take out a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And that mortgage is going to be based off of a fixed interest rate, which is consistent with our uniform annuity framework. And the number of periods is going to be defined by the duration of the mortgage 30 years, uh, which is going to correspond to 360 monthly payments. So the task at hand here, is we need to amortize that remaining loan balance of $400,000. That is gonna be key in this problem, the lump sum value we need to amortize into a uniform 30-year mortgage payment stream uh, that involves 360 periods of payment, 360 months. And those payments are gonna include both uh, the principal as well as the interest on the funds that were loaned. Uh, so that is the task at hand. Now, uh, note, we're looking for monthly payments, so we have appropriately measured the time period, T, already in months, right? 360 months is just 12 months in a year times the 30-year duration of the mortgage. However, the APR, the annual percentage rate of 4%, is not measured in months. It's a yearly rate. Uh, fortunately, APRs are easily convertible into a compound monthly rate using, uh, in some sense, a simple interest conversion here. This is one of those rare exceptions where I told you guys, you know, wouldn't really see simple interest a whole lot dealing with uh, asset pricing and valuation. Uh, but this is a rare example where if we just take the APR and we divide it by 12, the number of months in a year, then we would convert that annual rate into the equivalent uh, monthly rate, and that monthly rate would be uh, a compound monthly rate. That would be the appropriate interest rate to use in the pricing formula if we were looking for monthly payments. Uh, if we forgot to do this step to convert everything into months, if we measured T in years and we kept the interest rate in years and we applied the amortization formula, we would wind up getting a yearly mortgage payment as if you only pay your mortgage one time per year. Um, which is not very realistic. I doubt there's any mortgages out there structured that way. Um, but that would be the mistake we would be making. If we forgot to convert everything into months, if we left everything in years, we would get a yearly mortgage payment, only 30 of those in the cash flow stream, uh, as opposed to 360 monthly payments in the cash flow stream we're trying to engineer here. Um, so if we took 4%, we divide it by 12, we get an interest rate, a uh, monthly interest rate here, of uh, a third of a percent and the bar above the threes uh, means those are non-terminating decibels they go on forever uh, so we basically have the important parameter values uh, found now set up to solve the problem and we're going to go ahead and apply that inverted uniform pricing formula to amortize this mortgage loan balance and compute the size of the monthly payments that would correspond to taking out a loan of $400,000 and paying that back uniformly over 30 years at this APR of 4%. Uh, so here is our inverted uniform annuity pricing formula, right? We solve for X and now we're going to go ahead and plug in the relevant values into the formula here. And when we do this, we see that the mortgage payments per month, come out to $1,909.66. Um, so you can imagine if you were paying more than that per month in rent, uh, it might be in your best interest to go ahead and, and try to buy a house. You would pay less um, in your mortgage payments and actually own the house as opposed to just throwing away uh, rent money. Uh, anyhow, this is a good numerical example to see the application of uh, amortizing an expense with time value. The second application I mentioned uh, of the uniform annuity framework is considering something known as a perpetuity. 
Uh, so we're going to now think about extending our analysis by looking at that same payment stream where we've purged X zero, we don't have X zero. Uh, we're going to impose the uniform annuity condition. So all those X's are going to be the same. And then we're going to allow T to go in the limit towards infinity so that the cash flow stream is making equal payments of X dollars every period into perpetuity, literally forever. And you might think that such an asset uh, might be worth an infinite amount since the benefit flow is never ending, but this actually turns out not to be the case. Um, the pricing formula does converge to a well-defined finite value. And it turns out to be surprisingly simple to compute once you uh, circumvent a little bit of the conceptual nature of taking this limit as T goes to infinity. Um, you might think, why buy an asset that never stops paying you if I have to pay for the whole thing, right? I'm gonna die before I collect some payments that I've already paid for. And the answer is when you do die, you can always bequeath that asset to your heirs and they'll be able to keep collecting the payments on that perpetuity flow. Uh, so in that regard, um, you know, when you do buy this type of asset, people do purchase infinite uniform annuities. They do purchase perpetuity flows here. Uh, they can be bequeathed. Uh, so this is a, a real thing. This is not a theoretical hypothetical thing here. Uh, so we're basically going to exploit the finite case of the uniform annuities pricing formula and take the limit of the price as T goes to infinity. Okay, that is the idea here. So recall uh, the pricing formula, and I've used a little subscript here, F-I-N, to denote uh, that is the finite uniform annuity pricing formula. Uh, we can look at either the pricing formula in terms of um, delta, or we can look at it in terms of R, the interest rate. Uh, we're actually gonna work on both at the same time, and we're gonna think about taking the limit of these expressions as T goes to infinity, so that the price of the infinite annuity, we're gonna think of as the limiting case of the price of the finite annuity. Okay, and if we're doing this in terms of the discount factor as we have it written out currently, we would take the limit of this expression, or we could use the far right hand treatment and think about taking the limit in terms of writing the pricing formula in terms of the interest rate. Uh, we'll actually do both of these together so you can see it from both perspectives here. Um, so again, the price of the perpetuity, <laughs> And the infinite annuity here we've argued has to be uh, equal to this limiting value. And again, recall that the discount rate had this, or sorry, the discount factor rather, there's a little bit of a typo in this slide. It says rate, uh, should say factor instead of rate in that second bullet point. But that value of delta uh, is between zero and one because we argued the opportunity cost of time, R, uh, has to be positive. Um, so if R is positive, delta is between zero and one, which means when we raise delta to higher powers, the result gets smaller, right? If you take one half and you square it, it becomes a quarter, it becomes smaller. Uh, so as a consequence of this idea, when we take the limit of delta raised to a higher power and we make that power very large, okay, this is the same thing as taking one over one plus R and raising it to a higher power. If we send that power to infinity, okay, then the result converges in the limit to zero. So that tells us both of these terms in red, whether we're using the discount factor method or the discount rate expression for the pricing function, those terms in red both go to zero, meaning both of the terms in blue here are equal to one in the limit. And that gives us a pretty simple form for the perpetuity pricing formula, right? The infinite uh, annuity case here. Um, and we should be able to see where these expressions come from, right? Given that these terms in blue go to one, okay, this term in red is what is left when we take the limit using the discount factor expression for the pricing function. And this term in red, is what is left over when we use the discount rate, the interest rate version of the pricing function. 
And you'll notice, um, you know, that last term at the very bottom of the screen, just X divided by R. That is how you would calculate it. The easiest way to calculate the price of a perpetuity that pays you X dollars per period forever at an interest rate of R. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up with an example. Uh, and we'll compare the new example to our old example. So recall in an earlier example in this video, we priced a finite uniform annuity stream that made 30 annual payments of $20,000 per year at an annual interest rate of 5%. And using the pricing formula in the finite annuity framework, uh, this particular cash flow stream, this particular uh, finite uniform annuity would cost us $307,449. Now we're going to go ahead and consider the value of a perpetuity at the same interest rate, at a 5% interest rate, making payments the same size, so still making $20,000 payments every year, but there's going to be no end to these payments. So instead of 30 payments, there are now an infinite number of payments. And you might be surprised when you apply the perpetuity formula here to see that the value of all those extra payments after 30, right? We know the first 30 payments are equal to in value $307,449. But it turns out all the payments after the 30 only add about uh, $92,500 to the value of the entire cash flow stream as measured in present dollars. Okay, so the infinite annuity here that pays you $20,000 every year at 5%, what would that cost you? Well, you would have to go to the bank and you would have to shell out $400,000. So if you wanted to buy that type of retirement asset, right, this infinite annuity, this perpetuity, okay, it would cost you $400,000 and it would pay you $20,000 every year forever. And you could bequeath that, uh, you know, when you pass on. Um, so a couple of concluding remarks here. Uh, in this segment, we derive the uniform annuity pricing formula by applying the classical theory of asset pricing. We found the form of the pricing function for both the case of the finite as well as the infinite uniform cash flow stream, right? The infinite case being called a perpetuity or a perpetual cash flow. Uh, we applied the pricing function to amortize a lump sum value, converting it into a cash flow, uh, cash flow stream by accounting for the time value of money. And we did this by looking at three numerical examples. Uh, next up, we're going to be applying our uh, discussion of pricing, applying the classical theory to thinking about the specifics of bond contracts. So we'll talk about uh, what the structures of a bond contract are, um, specific names for the interest payments, the coupons that bonds make. Uh, we'll apply the classical theory to pricing the bond. Think about the relationship between the price of the bond and the yield on the bond. The two are often uh, treated as really the flip side of the same coin. And we'll discuss a little bit of detail related to something known as the yield curve, which captures the term structure of interest rates. Uh, we'll wrap up by kind of uh, changing gears a little bit and pricing common stock, thinking about how do we price a share of equity. And we're going to treat the dividend stream that you would get from owning equity as a deterministic cash flow stream, much like we have uh, been um, exploiting in this framework. And we're going to investigate a slight variation of the uniform annuity framework, a situation where the payments actually do change over time. They're not constant, but they have a very particular structure to them known as a geometric growth structure. And we're gonna price what's called a geometric growth perpetuity and apply this to the equity valuation of, um, of stock, really to value equity using what is known as the Gordon dividend discount model, the dividend growth model. Um, so that is it for this segment. Uh, keep an eye out, hope you enjoyed and happy hunting.